We're now at episode 3 of The Walking Dead, titled Tell It to the Frogs, which does not refer to gross things happening with amphibians, since this episode is considerably less graphic than Guts. Everyone with an unsteady stomach can relax. The previous episode ended with Rick and the survivors successfully escaping from the walkers in Atlanta with zero fatalities, but unfortunately, Merle Dixon was left handcuffed on a rooftop with only the slim chance of surviving the horde. It turns out that, although no one in the group is particularly sorry about this, he does have a brother who is none too happy to find out why Merle won't be returning. Another person who isn't so happy is Shane, because Rick making it to the group at long last and being reunited with Laurie and Carl means that she's going to have to choose between her two men and she makes that choice very quickly even telling Shane to stay away from her family. She might end up one man down very soon, however, since Rick feels guilty about leaving Merle behind and wants to appease his brother by going back into Atlanta to rescue him, also motivated by a bag of more guns and ammo he dropped when he was first attacked, so themselves, T-Dog and a very reluctant Glenn head back into the proverbial lion's den. Although, the presence of a walker so close to the camp suggests Atlanta isn't that much more dangerous than anywhere else right now. Tell It to the Frogs continues the character introductions, showing us that there are more survivors to be found in the camp, such as the abusive misogynist Ed Pelletier, if that's how you say his and Carol's last name, I'm not too sure, his wife Carol, and their daughter Sophia, but of course most prominently, Mel's brother Daryl Dixon, played by Norman Reedus, who, like John Burnfall, was so impressed with the show's script that he said he would happily audition even for a day player role. There was a rumour that he was originally auditioning for Mel, but that's only because those were the lines he was asked to read in the room, as Michael Rooker had already been cast as Mel. The role of Daryl was recurring for the first season, but quickly upgraded to regular due to fan popularity in season 2, and it wouldn't be controversial to say he's one of the most popular characters in the franchise, placing second on a list of the top 30 characters on the show by Rolling Stone, and being named the best character by TV Guide. And watching this episode, it's easy to see why, since Norman Reedus instantly makes his presence felt, and already there are two moments that indicate Daryl is not just a racist redneck like his brother, especially his heartbreaking reaction to discovering that Merle has sawed his own hand off at the end of the episode. Norman Reedus really goes for it with the emotion there. It's a very fitting introduction to a future icon of the franchise. Another character who gets the spotlight shone is Laurie, who now has to deal with the conflict of finding out her husband is alive and trying to pretend nothing has changed, seemingly hiding her affair with his best friend. And a new development in the seeding of the affair is revealed. Shane told Laurie that Rick was dead. This allows her to be presented in a more complicated light, being framed as someone who made an assumption and attempted to move on whatever way she could while her world was falling apart around her. Sarah Wayne Callies confesses that Laurie is genuinely happy to have Rick back and guilty at how he'd been alive this whole time without her knowing. She even attempts to apologise for the problems they'd been having before and it's played very sincerely. But remember that Laurie is considered one of the worst characters? Rather than coming clean to Rick and explaining the situation that unfolded because she thought he was dead, she tries to pretend the affair didn't happen and orders Shane away to stay away from her and the family, refusing to even discuss the matter with him. In this scene here, Rick ironically says that the two have been given a second chance, not knowing that Laurie is being presented with a chance of her own and squandering it by trying to avoid the consequences. And you could even argue that her giving Rick her approval to go back into Atlanta and risk his life for Merle might be motivated by the possibility of him dying and solving her problem for her, although she clearly is glad to have her husband back. That situation subtly draws a contrast between her and Rick. He has very strong morals and will follow them at the potential cost of his life simply because it's the right thing to do. She will try to see what she can get away with. Another character who begins to turn is Shane, who likewise is shown in a very complicated light. Rick was his best friend and he left him believing he was good as dead and has begun an affair with his assumed widow and started acting as a surrogate father to Carl, possibly also out of guilt for leaving the boy without his real dad. And now that Rick has come back into the picture, Shane is pushed away and forbidden from seeing the child he clearly cared for, whilst also having to pretend that everything between them and Laurie never happened and we see that evolve in quite a direction. As an incident where Ed assaults his wife and is about to attack the rest of the women trying to defend her, see Shane beating him up in front of them. While obviously coming to the rescue, we see him become much more aggressive in dealing with Ed, with the framing and reactions from the woman making it clear he's gone too far, and perhaps signalling that Shane is headed in an unexpected direction. John Burnfall in fact had no idea of how Shane would develop when he first signed on, but that's the beauty of the writing on this show. So tell it to the frogs, referring to Laurie's way of telling Shane to go F himself, is the most character focused episode yet, with the only walker appearing on screen being easily killed by Daryl, and far more emphasis on the drama surrounding the ensemble. It's surprising how quickly the episode flew by, showing how well the drama and character moments were integrated into the story. Even little bits like the women jerking about what they miss, or Shane and Carl playing in the river, do so much for the world building and give you a real sense of the kind of world these characters exist in now. Everyone gets a little bit of something, and this episode allows the show to breathe. 
and for the audience to properly settle into this universe. Likewise, critics praised it for returning to the slower and more thoughtful pace of the pilot, marking that The Walking Dead had well and truly begun to hook the world. Paul Melder, being too dim to realise that a hacksaw was designed to cut through metal, meaning he didn't have to pull a saw to get off that rooftop. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, it's free, and leave a comment on your thoughts down below.